my inspiration for the story, it all starts with the magical Negro trope. Um, and just to define that on my own terms, uh, the magical Negro trope is a recurring character in movie history. Um, it's a black character who doesn't have his or her own internal life. They're only really there to support the white protagonist. And we can all sort of picture the, the, the films that that's, uh, uh, that occurs in. And I you know, grew up as a kid in the, the 90s watching a, a run of these films be really celebrated and Oscar nominated and lauded. And I was always sort of agitated by them <laughs> and didn't really know why. And then when I heard the name of the trope and Spike Lee articulated that, it, something sort of snapped in my head. And I said, oh, that's, um, that's the thing that's been bothering me. And uh, uh, the, the original inspiration for this film is just trying to respond to that trope and, and speak to uh, what it did to me and didn't do to me and um, uh, some other things. The tone of the film is very particular, and um, the way I always describe its um, sense of play is that you, you're always trying to find that exact line between um, wouldn't that be crazy if it happened and that's so crazy it would never happen, and trying to ride right up against the edge of that, um, which is partially a um, uh, a joy thing. You want to be having as much fun and as much play and as much silliness as you can find in a big, full-hearted comedy like this. Um, but, but also you have to maintain the credibility of the world um, because even though it's a comedy and it's funny and, and there are um, very sort of silly aspects to it, what I'm actually writing about is, is, is deadly serious and, and quite painful and embarrassing and, and finding that balance of that reality and that play that makes it possible to discuss those really challenging um, issues and feelings. That's the, the balance I was trying to strike. As a culture, I think we're pretty good at telling stories about overt racism. So slavery stories, legal discrimination, um, we're reasonably good at telling those stories, partially because they're, they're, they're visual. Someone was enslaved, someone was free. Someone couldn't drink at a water fountain, and then they could. But in my life, the more um, common impacts of racism, and, and I would argue the more insidious uh, version of racism is the sort of pervasive systemic racism that leads to unconscious bias, leads to all kinds of troubling economic and political and social realities, but it's incredibly hard to, to pin down. It's a ghost in the machine is the, the phrase. I think it's Toni Morrison's phrase. And, and one of the things I, I hope to do with this story and with a lot of my stories is try to make that almost intangible, invisible quality of racism tangible and visible. In this film, one of the, the, the stories we're telling is about a black man's relationship to himself and his own sense of value and his own sense of worth. And, and to me, watching that, um, the revelation that systemic racism has undermined his sense of self, watching him learn that is very powerful, and watching him take these baby steps to move beyond that, um, uh, again, sort of insidious, um, degrading uh, racism that's even in his own mind, watching him take steps to move beyond that to me is, is really inspiring and a really modern um, uh, encapsulation and response to racism that reflects the kind of racism that, that I experience as opposed to the, the kind of racism that the, the generations that came before me did. I think we're reasonably good as a culture at telling stories about overt racism, you know, so, so slavery stories, legal segregation stories. What I think we're less effective at as storytellers and less practiced at is telling stories about the, the subtle and insidious and systemic ways that racism seeps into our culture and our politics and even into our own minds. And um, I would argue that that, that quality of racism is um, uh, one of the main uh, sort of manifestations that we need to be fighting and responding to now. And so as storytellers, part of our obligation as black storytellers is to try to figure out how to depict that very slippery and insidious and hard to, um, uh, to, to, to see thing. And in this story, uh, the way I approach that is by trying to tell quite simply the story of a man who is um, impacted by the, the systemic racism around him and, and this sort of first story of him sort of coming into awareness of the ways in which um, things like the Magical Negro story have seeped into his brain and, and changed his understanding of himself.
to me, telling stories on that amplitude um, and watching a black character grow beyond that is, is both a, uh, a really important document in terms of, of naming and articulating that particular quality of racism that we're less effective at telling stories about, and also hopefully um, inspiring to people and watch someone in watching a character move beyond it. Many of the microaggressions in this film are things that have actually happened to me, and uh, it's always really tricky when you're satirizing stuff because I you sometimes write something and it seems too big, but it happened, right? And and so you know people have have said you know crazy things to me about my accomplishments and how I got here and why race was a part of that, just just astonishing things to my face, you know, and not understood the the sort of impact of that you know um, and 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 other examples and uh, and <laughs> you know you're just trying to sort of tell that story in in certain respects but it almost seems too big because it's um the things racism makes people do are crazy <laughs> you know it's amazing to be able to premiere the film at Sundance. I developed it through the Sundance Writers Lab and Directors Lab. Um, it's where I met Justice Smith, who plays the lead for the first time. So uh, being able to go back there and premiere the film there, it felt like a bit of a homecoming, and that was um, a, a really special thing. The American Society of Magical Negroes is a secret underground society, um, and their mandate is to eliminate white discomfort. So what they do every morning is they wake up, and the members of their society, they try to make white people comfortable. Um, it's a great time to mention this film is a satire, uh, <laughs> and so that is not work, as you can imagine, that I earnestly think I or any black person should be doing, but um, it, part of what this film is about um, is the uh, defense mechanism that I was taught as a young black person um, of uh, how to survive in America. And that particular defense mechanism was being um, uh, accommodating and polite to white people with power. Um, the classic example of that is, you know, the talking to a cop, you know, my dad sat me down very early and said, hey, this is how you need to talk to a cop to survive. It's not about your pride, it's not about feeling good, this is just what you need to do. And the American Society of Magical Negroes takes that um, philosophy and uh, hyperbolizes it and says, hey, what if that's what this particular group of black people does every single day all the time? And um, you know, as, as well-intentioned as that uh, lesson is, I think it also speaks to the, the uh, immense coercion that black people face in America in terms of what they have to do and what we have to do to, to navigate um, uh, systemic racism. Aaron is recruited into the American Society of Magical Negroes um, because he's incredibly nice. Um, that's his whole thing. He's, he's non-confrontational, he doesn't like conflict, he's extremely accommodating, particularly to white people. And in the sort of twisted logic of my satirical society, that's what skill looks like. Being really good at making white people comfortable is a superpower to these particular individuals. And so Roger, um, uh, who is an older member of the society, sees this talent and recruits him into the society. Roger is uh, the sort of mystical mentor figure to Aaron who sees him and recruits him into the society. Um, concretely, he is a, a wonderful, uh, wise old wizard. Um, and symbolically, he stands in for um, all of the older black people in my life who, with real love, tried to teach me how to stay alive. And, um, and I, I hope <laughs> is both a, a way to look at some of those strategies and say, you know, maybe not for us, maybe that's not, not what's best for, for me and, and for my generation, but also to look, I, I hope, with, with real empathy at the obstacles that, that people in his generation and, and even earlier black people had to face and, and have some grace for the absolutely astonishing things, the utterly fantastical things black people have had to do to survive in this country. Roger is definitely inspired by my dad and uh, a host of other older black people who, uh, with, with the best of intentions, tried to give me some lessons to survive in America. And um, obviously the film is, and I am, uh, you know, critical of those uh, survival strategies as things that are ultimately undermining for me and, and a lot of black people, but I also really do have empathy for, uh, for a generation of black people who had to do what they had to do to survive. And, and I have very little patience for people criticizing 
any black person doing whatever a black person has to do to survive in America, because to me, all of that criticism and all of that um, quite appropriate anger should all be directed at systemic racism. Lizzie is Aaron's coworker at uh, Meatbox, the tech company that his white client Jason works at. And uh, initially, um, uh, Lizzie and Aaron have their own flirtation that looks like it might become something, but Jason uh, falls for Lizzie as well. And because Jason is Aaron's client, Lizzie is all of a sudden off limits to Jason. So there, uh, this sort of um, uh, Cyrano situation arises where Aaron has to quite excruciatingly help Jason pursue the woman that they're both interested in. Something that was really important to me in making this film was to try to be uh, better and more empathetic than the people that made Magical Negro films. And to me, one of their major failings was not really thinking through the experience of uh, marginalized people who weren't them, black people in the case of those, those white writers. And so in making this film, to me, the most effective response to that is to say, hey, I'm going to articulate my experience as a black person, but I also want to make sure I acknowledge these other marginalized people who are also impacted by systemic racism and, and try to have more empathy for them than uh, the white writers of Magical Negro films. So uh, t to me, that's the, the, the sort of... Um, behind the scenes reason that I wanted to center, uh, you know, a woman of color who, you know, in a different way than a black person also suffers under these systems. But to me, one of the best things we can do for ourselves is sort of link hands with all the people that are suffering under these systems and say, hey, we're, we're in this together, even if we're impacted by these, these obstacles differently. I think humor is a, a tool to make impossible conversations possible. And there are a couple of things that are impossible about the conversation I'm trying to have in this film. One is th the shame of what I'm talking about is so intense. For, for me as a black person to raise my hand and say, hey, I feel like I over accommodated white people for my whole life is incredibly embarrassing. And to me, humor is what makes it bearable for me to say that out loud. And hopefully, if other black people have experienced things like this, we'll make it possible for them to look at those uh, behaviors in themselves and have some grace and some love and even laugh at those things. Thinking about white people as well, you know, there is a real shame, I think, in uh, feeling accused of racism. And uh, I think the best thing for the world is to normalize that feeling because racism is, is very common and, and you know, I would say it's not the crime, it's the cover up, right? So often it's not an in individual microaggression, it's the defensiveness after the microaggression that's the real um, um, issue in many cases, right? Um, but to, to give, to, to use laughter as a way for, for those people as well to be able to look at some of their own behaviors and look at some of the things that are, that are broken about America and, um, be able to look at them without turning away, to me, that's part of the, the function of humor. At the end of the day, it's a story about a guy who has trouble speaking up for himself, who learns to speak up for himself. And I think that's a pretty universal story. It's a love story. There are all of these incredibly universal things about it. But I, I think that the, the audience that will have the deepest connection to it are people who have felt uh, minimized or felt othered or felt pushed into the corner or made to be smaller than perhaps they are and anyone who's been sort of reduced in that way, I think, will feel um, hopefully um, a, a little bigger and a little bolder and a little more expansive for having seen the film. I'm talking about all these, these sort of heady political ideas, but, but to me, the best way to engage with them is to really go on a ride, you know, and to leave our world, even if I'm really talking about our world, and to leave ourselves, even if I'm really talking about it myself, and um, go on this sort of magical, wild, chaotic, funny experience. And, and there's something, to me at least, disarming about that, that, that makes it possible for me to engage with this serious subject matter, but also just in the departure from my real world, I feel like it's easier to come back and look at it um, um, with clear eyes. Justice Smith I met at the Sundance Labs and has been with the project for years and you know come over to my house and workshop different versions of the script over the years and and um, it's just a, a joy to work with. Um, David Allen Greer has always been a hero of mine. He's one of those um, uh, people who's been 
uh, funny and incredible as long as I've been alive. And so working with him was just a dream. Um, you know, Nicole Byer is a generationally charismatic human <laughs> who um, I was very excited to, to invite to do something that I don't think a lot of people have seen her do before. An Lee is in this role because she's an incredible actor. Uh, and that's the main reason. Um, that her chemistry with Justice is, um, I, I think, really special. Her work as an actor is so um, vulnerable and alive and playful and funny. Um, I just think she's a phenomenal actor. Um, the other aspect of An Lee's casting that I was really excited about is that An Lee is a very fair woman of color. She's a biracial woman of color. And one of the things this film is about is the false promise of assimilation. So in other words, the, the idea that if, oh, you just act a certain way, uh, you'll have the, 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 the privileges of, of whiteness. If you just uh, play along, assimilate, uh, you know, um, comply with the officer's orders, as it were, you'll be safe. And I don't think that's true. And in fact, I think that's a really dangerous lie that um, elements of America still tell. Uh, but to me, one of the, the sharpest ways to, to put the lie to that um, line of thinking is by taking two characters, Injustice and Ang Lee, who are close to white. Right? They have the greatest proximity to whiteness of any, any people of color. And to say that even those people, even people who look like that, and are trying as earnestly as those who are trying to accommodate white people, even they will never be invited into the full benefits of white privilege. To me, that sharpens that critique of the false promise of assimilation. So beyond her incredible skill and talent, which is the main reason she has this role, um, there is that um, sort of uh, racial imagery that to me sharpens the satire. I think the most challenging part of filmmaking is being incredibly honest with yourself. Um, and, and that's uh, when things aren't working. You know, say, hey, I love that. I thought that was going to be a great idea. It's, it's just not working. Um, and to be really honest about that. And, and also, to be honest in the other direction, to say, you know, I, <laughs> I still really believe in this idea. I really think this is working, even if uh, you know, it's not quite working the way I've cut it right now, or you know, someone's saying it's not quite working. You know, to be incredibly honest with yourself in both directions and be really ruthless with that honesty, um, to me, that's the, the, it's, it's a bit of a practice and, and really important to making something that feels um, of integrity. The best part of making the film is the collaboration, you know, and so that's, you know, early on with producers developing the script and with with Focus developing the script, but but then into prep. Prep is where it really gets fun for me, you know, because you know you're all in an office together and you're all there and you're all exchanging ideas and and then shooting is obviously its own thrill, um, you know, because the ac actors are one of my favorite collaborators, and so there's this brief beautiful window where you actually have them with you, um, and then editing is such a beautiful sort of storytelling process, you know, on through color and post. I mean, to me, it's the, the there's just such a pleasure in, in working with other people and bouncing off their ideas and, and that sort of sublime thing of getting to an idea and not knowing where it came from. We're sort of like, oh, I thought that was your idea. Oh, I thought that was your idea. No, no, that was your idea. You know, where it, it really becomes this sort of organism beyond all of you that has a life and a voice and a specificity to it, but, um, uh, uh, yeah, you all sort of had to, to come together to add your piece for it to have that, that sort of um, individuality.